Good morning. How's everybody doing? You're more awake, right? You're more awake. So the first service, my voice is lower, so it makes me feel more manly and stuff. And then we wake up a little bit more, it gets a little higher, then I'm not as manly. Just kidding. That's a joke. Okay, so here I am. It's good to be back. It's good to be with you. A few stories uh, to get us going, and then we'll rip into the word in Matthew chapter 7. Number one, I am the executive director of NeighborLink, so I just wanted to encourage you, challenge you to jump in, to get ready for August. 100 projects is about one-fifth of what we have available right now in the city. Every year we get about 3,000 asks from neighbors around the the community, around the city. We're able to do only about 45% of those because we're driven by volunteerism. And so the prayer is that Pine Hills family jumps in the gap in a way that, that changes that trajectory, not for the glory of NeighborLink, but for the glory of Jesus. Amen? So first story. Uh, I try to go do jobs as, as this director uh, throughout the city. And about a week and a half ago, uh, I went to mow a lawn uh, with another member here, another buddy here from Pine Hills. And uh, all we were doing is mowing a lawn. And so we get there with all of our lawn stuff, and we, we go knock on the door. And uh, as we uh, are greeted by a woman, we get invited into the home. And uh, this is the sister of the woman who owns the home. The, the owner of the home is 34 years old. Uh, she has days left to live, and she's in her hospice bed. And uh, she has three kids from 6 to 15, and she's in the middle of uh, some really hard marital stuff at the same time. And she invited us into her home to sit on her bed to be with her that day. I don't know. Uh, to, I, I checked in on her, but I don't know if she's still with us or not or if she's with Jesus. But I will say what's beautiful about NeighborLink is more than the project. It's the relationship that Jesus is inviting us into. We get to sit there and pray with a woman um, in, between, in between her very last breaths. And so I will tell you that that might be, that felt like the deep end of the pool for you, but all we were doing was mowing a lawn. And, and th- these folks are raising their hands and say, come on over. I- I'm in a spot where I can't do it myself. And, and I would just say that is a sweet spot that Jesus is inviting us into. And what if that was our daily rhythm, but let, let's just say August, we go sit in people's living rooms, we mow people's lawns, we fix people's homes. And, and what kind of relationships could happen, and more importantly, what kind of engagement could happen for the glory of Jesus? Just a question. Second story. So I'm uh, about 23, 24, 25. I don't remember now. I'm over 40. Time is escaping me. Uh, some of y'all are like, man, just wait. So anyway, I'm at a city prayer meeting. I've got my hat on backwards. I've got a couple tattoos at the time. That's a whole different story about how those tattoos happened. Uh, so I'm sitting there in this room with church people from all over the city. And as I sit, I got my head down, hat backwards, and I'm just praying. I'm just sitting there, chilling, minding my own business, talking to Jesus, listening to Jesus. And a woman came forward, pulls me up out of my seat. She's all of four foot ten, and says, You're coming up here with me. I said, Okay. And I shuffle up there. As I get up there, she uh, appropriately designates two men to stand behind me because she's going to start praying for me. If you know what that means, is they're going to get ready to catch me. So what that means for me is I'm going to stand in a football position. I'm going to flex every muscle in my body. And I'm going to stand there and take it like a man. And it ain't going down. So some people just stood there like this, and they're like a bobber getting busted by a bass. It doesn't work like that. I'm like football stance. My pastor that I'm serving with is staring at me like, bro, if you go down, this is legit. And so, so I'm standing there, and she starts standing in front of me. She starts talking to me. She goes, oh, honey, why are you running from the Lord? And I was like, um, I'm not. And she punches me in the chest. She's like, shaka boom, bang. And I was like, what the... So I'm just, I'm like, now I'm, I'm here and I'm there and this is going on. So I'm standing there. My feet are now grinding into the carpet. Like, like if you could do that, like if you can do that, you're special. So I'm there. I'm gripping the gospel shoes of peace, man. I'm like in there with cleats. Everything's clenched. And I'm in there. And she, she goes, why are you committing adultery on your wife? And I was like, she goes, 
bam. And I was like, what the? No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I love my wife. And she goes, why are you doing drugs then? She went down the whole laundry list of possibilities. I was like, I'm not. I'm not. I'm fine. She hits me three times. Each time I only got stronger in this moment because I was like, I'm, I'm ready for war. And then I, she didn't get it. So I said, ma'am, how about I pray for you? Is there any way I can pray for you? She switched spots with me, and she's ready for me to punch her in the chest and get, and get caught by these fellas. Neither of which happened. I did not knock her out, but I did pray for her. She did not fall. She had no idea that she was just like misapplying the word over and over and over again. Right? No clue. And then when I said if I could pray for her, she had no clue about what just happened. She was like, oh, yeah, yeah no problem. Let's do it. Story one. Not what we're talking about today, but so often we speak when we shouldn't, okay? We think we have the ideal for other people's lives when we should just shut our mouths, one. Two, uh, my wife and I had just started dating. I was 18, she was 17. This is where she normally says, you're going to pay me for bringing me up in your sermons. I've never paid for her, uh, for a story that I've used, but I continue on. So... 18, 17, we're, we're dating. We started writing music a month into our relationship. And about a year later, I was at a festival in Pennsylvania for about 30,000 students. It was like a Christian Woodstock without the Woodstock. <laughs> and so uh, we're there. I'm in a tent with maybe a few thousand people. And if you were there back in the 90s, late 90s, there was a band called Sonic Flood. Yay. So they were playing their music. I was all in. And and another man walks up to me out of the crowd. He did not look like he was doing that well. He looked, I would say, like he, he, uh, his, his clothes were disheveled, his face, body disheveled. And he walks up to me out of this crowd. He goes, hey, man. Hi. I'm 18, 19 years old. Hey, you play the guitar, don't you? I was like, yeah, and so does every young teenage boy here. That's what you do in youth group to get a lady. So... It worked. Um, so, so I'm there, and I said, yeah. And he goes, no, 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 like, you, you play the guitar. And he, he goes, you're going to travel the world and tell people about Jesus someday. And I was like, oh, that kind of guitar. And then I said, well, what about my future wife, Mandy? He goes, oh, she'll be singing on your hip. I was like, oh, okay. Put that in my pocket, walked away. Uh, the next summer, I was working at my dad's factory, and where he's, he's a vice president. And so I'm working on the factory floor, and a man walks up to me. It's like a straight-up drug deal. And he goes, here's $2,000. <laughs> Puts it in my hand. He goes, you're supposed to make an album with Mandy. Cool. I put that in my back pocket. <laughs> and then about two years later, I was at this really sweet space called Anchor Room. Who remembers Anchor Room? Yeah, we would play music there for three people, and uh, it was really good. It was like our Friday night was for three people and our family. And so um, we're there, holiday season, and there's this sweet pecan pie in the little glass cabinet there. And this woman in front of me really wanted it, but she, she was trying to decide if she could purchase it. So I was like, hey, let, we'll get you that pecan pie. And she goes, can I sit down with you? Absolutely. Let's sit down. She goes, hey, man, someday, I just have this, I have to tell you, someday you're going to travel the world and tell people about Jesus. And I'm like, okay, cool. And she said something like, Mandy, I don't see you traveling the world, but maybe more locally. And, I, and she's like, what the? <laughs> so we put that in our back pocket. We continue to serve in Fort Wayne. At 27, Mandy's 26, I started praying a secret prayer. Lord, kick us out of Fort Wayne or put us in concrete. It's your will. Your will be done. We'll do what you want to do, but there's, there's a stirring going on. So either kick us out or put us in concrete, whatever you want to do. Paid that, prayed that for a month without Mandy knowing and not really telling many people. Went on a trip, met a buddy from Maine. He's become one of our better friends came back to take a trip of about 10 folk, uh, 10 kids from Northside High School that didn't know Jesus. And we're like, man, these kids are going to know Jesus on this trip. It's for sure. Like, there's no reason that their families would let us take them. They don't know us, but they're letting us go on this trip. And 
Christ is going to be magnified in their hearts this week. So as I'm packing for this trip, I'm 27, 26, uh, Mandy's 26, I hear this voice say, sell everything you own, travel the world, tell everybody about me. Go check your email right now. Your pastor's going to tell you that I'm talking to you. And I was like, cool, okay. I went over to my computer, I remember, in our, our bedroom up in uh, Crescent Avenue. And I type in, says, you've got mail. My pastor hadn't slept. He goes, I haven't slept in three nights. And I, I believe the Lord wants me to tell you to sell everything you own and travel the world and tell people about Jesus. I was like, cool. Um, the end of the, the letter, I didn't say first service, was the best part. What happens if you fail? If it doesn't go well? He goes, you can start over. It'll be okay. Told Mandy, come up. At this point, I had a bed to catch me, no guys to catch me. I did fall back on a bed. Like, what the heck's going on? I'm crying. She comes up. She reads it. I tell her what's happening. She then reads the letter. She starts crying. The rest of the story is for another day. It was everyday miracles. And, and yet, you know, we had one person tell us what they thought, tell me what they thought the will of God was for me as she, she punched me in the chest. And then over the next 10 years, another individual started this train of God speaking to us about his will that he was to reveal to us in due season that we wouldn't be able to control, we wouldn't be able to manage, but eventually he would bring about. This text doesn't actually talk about either one of these. It talks specifically about the will of God for the people of God, which is what does it look like to live out the kingdom? And I think a lot of times when we talk about prophecy, we go to the extremes, the lefts and the rights and the big voices and the big this is and that's. But right here, Jesus just did the most eloquent, full sermon on the, the kingdom life, what it looks like to love him and love others in three chapters. And he says, this is what it looks like to walk out the will of God. And I believe that this is going to get heavier today for us than maybe we were ready for. While the, the stories may have some humor, I believe that Jesus is extremely serious, and he's extremely serious about you and me today. Uh, this isn't him mincing words, and so the, the kind of the title of, of this sermon is, Did Jesus Really Say? Just like the garden. Did God really say that? Let's pray. Jesus, you're... Alive and well, seated at the right hand of majesty, interceding for your church. And we are simply joining in with you as you have called us to yourself. Your spirit has spoken to us and he still speaks today through the written word that is alive. I pray whether we were coming here for, for multiple purposes or to see a family member baptized, whatever the backdrop may actually be of why we're here, that we would see that you've called us here to speak to us, that we're here to listen to you, to hear from you, to have our hearts soften and our ears open and our eyes see and our hands and our feet follow in step with what you've done in our lives. I do pray from the beginning of this time together that there would be repentance and belief and people will be born again. That this would not be a sermon uh, for a Sunday, but this would be you calling us to the life and life that is full and overflowing and abundant and glorifying to you. I pray, just as my brother said to me earlier, that the lungs that you've given breath to are the very words that you will use to speak. We ask that you would speak, that we would hear, and that you would be honored above all. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. So in the garden, questions ensued. Shots were fired. Peace was threatened. Relationship was shattered. Thousands of years later, those same questions and reverberations run through our streets and our minds. Did God really say? Will there really be consequence? Does sin lead to death? Can we become like God on our own? Can we befriend goodness without God? Our eyes see it. Our flesh feels it. Our mind thinks it just like Eve in the garden. There may be a better way, an easier way, a wider way. My friends, it's wartime. 
It's not peacetime. John Piper talks about this extremely well. We act like the war is over, and while he is won, we fight all the way home. So if you've been on the bleachers casting stones at those that are on the field, or you forgot that you've been enlisted in the Lord's army, that you're a son or daughter of the king, he would call you and me to wake up, O oh sleeper. Chapter 7, 13 and 14 opens up the door for 15 through 23. Jesus says in verse 13, to set up this context, after preaching this incredible sermon, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Over the last several minutes with his disciples, hours with his disciples and those that were listening, Jesus would unpack what it looks like to love him and love others. Think about that. Jesus' fullest sermon expounds on the idea of worship and relationship with others. It's not this general abstract idea, love God, love others. He goes, here's how it looks. Here is the fruit that will be born. He said, ordinary, average Joes will be blessed, and as they are blessed in me to be broken and see their poverty and mourn over their sin and become humble and, and hungry and thirsty for righteousness and people of peace and mercy and purity and willingly rejoice over persecution, those folk are going to be salt and light to the world. They're also going to be a people that are centered on Christ. They're going to see that all of the law is fulfilled in Christ Jesus, just like Jesus would say in Luke 24. Man, the prophets and the psalms and the songs, they're all about me. He says these people will be reconcilers. They won't just partake of communion. They will reciprocate the communion The fellowship of forgiveness will be given freely. My friends, our age and and in our culture, people want unity. Unity is a fruit. In fact, unity is a person. His name is Jesus. You shoot at Jesus, you get unity. You shoot at unity, you get more dysfunction. He's the reconciler. Check it out. The kingdom people, the kingdom life, will be a people who fight their own sin aggressively. What if we stopped looking at everybody else's sin in church and out of church? What if we actually fought our own sin like we fight everybody else? That's the flavor of the kingdom people. We take marriage seriously. We're faithful to our word. We give our rights up for others. I can't even go there right now. That is a fruit of Jesus. We love our enemies, Matthew 5, 43 through 47. That is not a flavor of American or American Christianity, but it is a flavor of Jesus. Jesus. We can excuse it all day long and give us a route around it, but that's the temptation. Don't confuse the nation we live in or are from with the kingdom that we serve. We we are commanded to be perfect, and Jesus says, you are and you will become. He will enable you to be that which he has made you through his spirit. He says we're called to give secretly yet expectantly. There's going to be a reward, but we're not bragging about it. We're not on street corners banging our chest, letting our right hand and left hand brag about what they've done. But we give because we've been given to. We pray in secret. We learn dependency. 
We learn for his kingdom to come and his will to be done. We learn what it's like to need him and trust him. We learn what it looks like to forgive because we've been forgiven. We learn that it's about his kingdom first, not mine. We fast in secret, yet with joy. He says, you're going to be a people who invest in heaven first with your best. I grew up during an age where retirement was the goal. My friends, if if you're a parent that have taught your kids education, job, retirement is the goal, I'm not saying those aren't valuable, but it's kingdom first. A lot of our kids are anxious because they're trying to fill their bank accounts for their future rather than the well of Christ. We trust Christ and seek his kingdom first. We fight our own sin first. Pastor Mike talked about this so that we can gently help others stuck in sin. Justin spoke last week. We ask, we seek, we knock, we have a good father. We go to him first. That's the life that Jesus expounds on over the previous two and a half chapters. Think about that. And then he says, my way, my gate is narrow and hard. And in the Greek, what it would be, the continuation would be, so beware, so watch out. So he describes the life of a Christian, a follower of Christ, a person of the kingdom, and he says, hey, yeah, it's narrow and it's, it's hard, so watch out because people are going to want you to go a different way. Church, if you've repented, believed, and been born again, you've been given a new heart, cleansed from your unrighteousness, his spirit's been put inside of you, and he causes you to obey his statutes, this is our life. This is our life. We want people to speak big things. We want to know where we're going with our life. God, what's your will? It's right here. His will is kingdom first, right here. You can trust him if he's going to speak to you five years, ten years, twenty years from now, what he wants you to do. That's his mysterious and majestic will that is not fully revealed to us. But this is revealed. In fact, in Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that belong to us and our children's children's children. It's like the song, Blessing. Is Christ in us? The mystery that's revealed is Christ in us. All the rest of the mystery brings us to majesty. Oh man, you're too wonderful. I don't understand it. But what you have told me is Christ in me, and you will cause me to live this kingdom out. So then Jesus says in verse 15 Beware of false prophets, false messengers, false ambassadors. They would lead you away from the hard or the narrow way. They're going to come to you in sheep's clothing. They're going to look like you. They're going to smell like you. They might even eat like you, but they are not you. See, wolves travel in packs. They're extremely strategic. They are very uh, intentional about their movements and their patterns, and they wait for vulnerabilities. They wait for the weakness in the lowest part of your wall to be able to be exploited on their terms so that they can take you out with the least energy. Which is why they blend in. He said, but you'll be able to tell them by their fruit. Let me give you a few passages I believe you should write down or text into your phone about such wolves, false prophets, people that would lead us away from the kingdom living, the narrow way or the hard way. I mean, listen, I hear you and I understand you that I would rather an easier way, an even wider way, but that is not Jesus' way. Acts 20, 25 through 31, he says, these folk will come from the outside and the inside. These people will come from the outside to attack you and kill you, your spirituality, and from the inside to um, lead you astray. In 
Deuteronomy 13. You're going to need to read the whole chapter. He said, there's going to be a prophets, they'll come, leaders that will come, and they will do miracles amongst you. And they'll say, hey, let's go serve these other gods. Don't go. I'm your rescuer. I redeemed you from Egypt. Don't be tempted by that miracle. Don't be tempted by that work. Come home. So you might have a family member or a dear friend come in and say, hey, we should go serve other gods. Don't go. Come home. I'm your redeemer. I'm your rescuer. You may have a stranger come into your life and they're going to say, hey, let's go over there. God's over there. Stay home. I'm your redeemer. Jesus is saying the very same thing to us in this sermon. People are going to come with other ways. It's not my way, guys. I'm your redeemer. Come home. It says in Ezekiel 13 and Jeremiah 23, 16, these folk will be led by their own hearts and their own spirits to give you false hope. They'll be led by their own heart and their own spirit. And Jeremiah 23 says, to give you a false hope. And lastly, in 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3, they're going to secretly introduce you to destructive heresies and fabricated stories. Jesus wasn't mincing words, my friends. He gave you and me a life to live. He said, Mark 1, 14, repent, believe. You'll be born again. John chapter 3, verse 7. You must be born again. And then he goes and shows us the life of being born again. We're looking out there for something that he's already given us. And folks are coming in and out of our lives to say, hey, over there, 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 over there. That's the No, this is the kingdom. This is the will of the Father for you and me. The world longs to meet the real Jesus. Not some fake, not some phony, not some fable, not some fairy tale. This Jesus, the one that forgives without hesitation, the one who lays their life down, down to serve their enemy. Now, Jesus goes and takes this to a deeper level in 21 through 23. My friends, I ask you to sit, like, sit in this for a moment. Sundays are so quick. Life is a vapor. You may, I may, just need to hear this for this moment to change that vapor. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. What if the whole last three chapters were about the will of the Father? What if we've gotten convinced that it's about his name and later on about miracles and prophecy and rescuing demons? Meanwhile, God says, those are all great, but that's not what I've asked of you. I've commanded you to live this life as I just preached it. That's my will. Later on in Thessalonians and Romans, he would break down and say, hey, my will is for you to be thankful, to be sanctified, to be transformed. We surely know that John 6, 29 says, the work of the Father is you would believe in the one who was sent. With my last few minutes, I'd like to say this. When I, was, when I was a little kid, I knew who I was. I struggled along that path. God was very kind to speak into my life and protect me from myself. I started uh, teaching and preaching at 13. I'll never forget it. With my note cards, my shirt off to the side because I couldn't put the lapel mic on properly. And I'm just like, what the heck am I doing here? 
my youth pastor was so kind to let a fool like me try to stumble through the news of Jesus. By 14, I knew I was going to be a pastor. By 17, 18, 19, God was already speaking in fresh ways to change the trajectory of what would happen and what we'd be doing. By 20, we're helping plant churches. By 26, 27, we're missionaries on the road. By 29, we're replanting a church in Fort Wayne. By 34, we're being sent out to Maine to be missionary planters. And what I would say is, we got to Maine, and we did a bunch of cool things. We hung out on the streets with heroin addicts while we fed them. In the snow and in the rain, it was one of the more beautiful pictures um, that we've ever seen of, of just gathering with the tax collector and sinner and I'm talking a plethora of people in a parking lot that are all doped up hearing the good news of Jesus. We'd hang out in homes of refugees and immigrants. We'd hang out downtown at the, the city level with uh, my job and hustle for a paycheck. And we would uh, we'd go and buy or co-own a gym and see people at the front door that would never be in proximity to Jesus. And there was a lot of good things that happened But, if I could throw myself under the bus, what if all of that was good, but that was not what the Lord asked of me? What if that was the wilderness that he intended so that we would run dry, do good things, and be called back to the kingdom of God? What if serving in all those ways weren't the ways he actually wanted us to serve? What if preaching all those ways wasn't what he wanted me to preach? What if hanging out with those on the streets? Man, that sounds great until you, until you recognize that my heart was dry and weary and I was far from Jesus. What if we're doing the right things? But Jesus goes, man, that's not what I have for you. The sermon that I, I've given you, I do have for you. I do want to be with you, and I want to show you a more excellent way. I want to show you how to love your enemy and forgive those who hurt you. I want to show you what it's like to depend on me and not hustle for a dollar. What if I didn't have to work 80 to 100 hours a week to pay my bills, but I stayed home and waited? What if I wasn't in a coma every night where I was exhausted because I was trying to provide for myself and my wife and kids? What if I wasn't going from one job to the next job to hang out with people in the middle of Portland just because that's what I thought I was supposed to do? What if I just waited and trusted and sought first the kingdom of heaven? What if, what if I didn't get distracted by what I thought ministry was for who ministry is for. My friends, my story isn't, oh, you've always been faithful. No, he has. The second thing of my story is, just like you, just like Israel, Jesus tends to allow us to go through wilderness so that we crave Real water and real bread in a, in a weary and dreary land. My prayer for you and me is that this would be the kingdom life. That we wouldn't negotiate. That we wouldn't rip out the hard parts for easier parts. But that we would really believe that seeking first the kingdom of heaven is our lives. We can say his name. We can do great things. But what if that's not the will of the Lord? The will of the Lord, my friends, is right in front of you. And it's got a really sweet thread tied to your heart. And if you start pulling on it, watch out. Yes, there will be distractions. Yes, people will try to pull you to the left or to the right. Yes, there will be temptations. But he will be good. 
What happens, Pine Hills Church, if we as a family believe that Matthew 5 through 7 is a life we've been called to live that, that bears fruit of loving God, loving one another, and loving our neighbors? What if we don't look for the next thing, the next what God has for me, but we, we, we double down on what he's put before us? What happens? What happens to our marriages what happens to our parenting? What happens to our city? What happens to our neighbors? What happens to our workplace? What happens to our relationships if we actually believe that this is the way of Jesus? I don't know if the world has tasted much of this, but I want to.